Sheltering the town of Brun amidst the first serious winter snows, La Grande Armée awaited orders as Emperor Napoleon planned his next moves. Having defeated the Russo-Austrian army at Austerlitz only a few days before, it signed an armistice with Emperor Francis II, effectively knocking Austria out of the war. It was now vital that this temporary truce be converted to a lasting peace, so Napoleon had his Minister of Foreign Affairs, Charles-Maurice de Talleyrand, depart Paris for Vienna to begin negotiations. A cautious man, the last thing Talleyrand wanted was for Austria to be dismembered in the peace. His logic, presented in a long memorandum, was that a large and friendly Austria would be a solid counterweight in Germany to both Russia and Prussia. Any territory stripped away had to be compensated with gains elsewhere. In Talleyrand's mind, land in Poland stripped from Russia and land in the Balkan taken from the Ottomans. But by the time Talleyrand did arrive in Austria, he'd received a stack of letters from Napoleon ordering him to do exactly what he'd advised against, take a big old chunk out of Austria. This about face in Napoleon's policy toward Austria seemed out of place, but we must remember that twice before Napoleon had been of the same opinion as Talleyrand, that a strong Austria was better than a weak Austria. At the Treaty of Campo Formio in 1797, Napoleon had treated a beaten Austria with a very light touch, ceding them the entirety of the Republic of Venice. The Austrians later reneged on these generous terms and formed the backbone of a resurgent second coalition. Their defeat at Marengo in 1800 led to the Treaty of Lunaville in 1801. Again, Napoleon was lenient. He kept Austria intact so that they would recognise French hegemony in Italy, Switzerland and the Netherlands. At both Lunaville and Campo Formio, the idea had been to reconcile Austria and not sow the seeds of a future conflict with a punitive peace. But since Austria had now twice joined coalitions against France, this policy had clearly failed. Now on the third strike... Napoleon would pursue a punitive peace that would reduce Austria to the status of a second-class power, unable to ever again jeopardise French ambitions. In spite of his justifiable reservations, Talleyrand played his part well, pushing a hard line in negotiations with Johann von Liechtenstein, himself fresh from the battle at Austerlitz. As ever, Italy was the focus of negotiations. By default, Austria essentially agreed to rescind all their claims to French-controlled Italy returning then to the terms of the Treaty of Lunaville. But since Archduke Charles had made a very credible attempt to recapture Italy from the French, and was only narrowly thwarted by André Massena, it was clear that promises and exclusive spheres of influence weren't enough to keep Austria out of Italy. The more permanent solution devised was to strip Austria of Venezia. This loss included not just the core province of Venezia, but the territories of the former Republic of Venice in Istria and Dalmatia, which had been annexed to Austria in 1797. Technically, all of this land was ceded to the Kingdom of Italy, but in practice, only Venezia proper would be seized. Dalmatia and Istria would be placed under French military occupation. Auguste Malmont, with Second Corps, was closest to the area, so he scored the gig of garrisoning and administering the region. Beyond the territorial losses, Austria formally agreed to recognise the Bonapartes of Italy. Napoleon as the King of Italy was legitimised, as was his Vice-Regent, Eugène Bernet. Elisa Bonaparte II was formally recognised as the Duchess of Luca Piombino. Napoleon carved out the diminutive duchy mostly to give Elisa something to do, as well as to diversify Bonaparte possessions. In Germany too, major territorial changes would be imposed by the French. Austria's claims to the crowns of Bohemia and Hungary would be respected, but the core Austrian territory of the Tyrol was to be ceded in its entirety to France's ally Bavaria. The strategic logic behind this was sound as the Tyrol had been the region from where Austrian troops connected their German and Italian fronts. Now that the Tyrol was in Bavarian hands, Austria's westward punch was severely curtailed, protecting both Italy and Switzerland. To make this pill go down a bit easier, Austria was compensated with the annexation of the Archbishopric of Salzburg and the County of Passau, both hardly fitting reimbursements for a core Austrian territory like the Tyrol, which had been in the Habsburg family since the 1300s. With the annexation of the Tyrol, Bavaria was elevated to the status of kingdom. Likewise, the Grand Duchy of Württemberg donned the purple as the Kingdom of Württemberg. The Duchy of Baden became the Archduchy of Baden. Aggrandized in status, Napoleon's German allies were also gifted new territories. Austria's now disconnected possessions in Swabia were divided between Baden and Württemberg as the spoils of war. As a result of these losses, Austria was deprived of 2.5 million subjects in one fell swoop. As per the terms of the treaty, 
they were also compelled to pay 40 million francs to France in war reparations. Having lost this sixth of their income, and now recovering from the damage done by the Grande Armée, Austria's financial future appeared bleak. But the loss in land and money paled in comparison to the loss in prestige. Having been brought to their knees by France, Austria accepted humiliating terms without real protest. Talleyrand and Liechtenstein signed the final terms on December 27th in the city of Pressburg, then part of the Kingdom of Hungary and today Bratislava, the capital of Slovakia. By then Napoleon had departed Brunn for Vienna, taking up residence in Schönbrunn Palace. There he met with Emperor Francis on the 25th. Tellingly, Napoleon made a point to snub the Archduke Charles, who only a few weeks ago had been menacing Napoleon's rear lines. Where before it could be said that they both shared a gentlemanly disregard as foes, an open rivalry was now undeniable. With Austria signing the Treaty of Pressburg, the wind spilled from the Third Coalition's sails. Jean-Marie Savary was sent as an envoy to the Tsar and reported that he was open to peace. And deserted by the other great powers, Great Britain now faced the prospect of fighting the war with only the aid of Naples and Sweden. Knowing this, there was serious talk from the Whigs about burying the hatchet with Napoleon. Aghast at this sentiment, Tory Prime Minister William Pitt the Younger put all his considerable energies into keeping Britain from quitting the coalition. But he appeared almost alone in his appetite for war. He held the line for as long as he could until, in January 1806, a lifetime of drinking and illness caught up with him. After Pitt's death, the Prime Ministership was succeeded to by fellow Tory William Grenville. Last we saw Grenville was in 1801, when he resigned alongside Pitt over opposition to Catholic suppression in Ireland. In subsequent years spent in the political doldrums, Grenville found common ground with Archwig Charles James Fox, an outspoken defender of both the American and French revolutions. Fox and Grenville were of the opinion that the war needed to end. So in February, Grenville founded the bipartisan Ministry of All the Talents, with Fox made the Secretary of State. In this capacity, Fox opened secret negotiations with the French. As a token of sincerity, he offered intelligence on a plot to assassinate Napoleon, which Talleyrand gratefully accepted. Such a promising opening was continued with extensive negotiations conducted over the next few months. The dramatic reversal of the coalition's fortunes at Austerlitz, and now the growing olive branches between Britain, France and Russia, radically altered Prussian diplomatic calculus. There had existed a strong pro-war faction in Berlin prior to the Battle of Austerlitz, led by Foreign Minister Karl August von Hardenburg. Citing France's violation of the Prussian exclave of Ansbach and the presence of a French army deep inside of Germany, Hardenburg promised King Friedrich Wilhelm III that war with France was coming sooner rather than later, so they'd best strike while Napoleon was overextended. More pressure was placed on Friedrich Wilhelm by his formidable wife, Queen Louise of mecklenburg strelitz As a member of minor German nobility, she was a long-standing proponent of the alliance with Russia. Louise believed that by supporting the Tsar in his war with France, Prussia could eject France from Germany and strengthen the Prussian-Russian alliance. Hardenborg and Queen Louise initially found their suggestions falling on Friedrich's deaf ears. Where his advisors were hawks, the king was a vulture, hoping to swoop in and take advantage of diplomatic developments. To his credit, so far this policy had worked. Prussia had gained Hanover bloodlessly and without compromising her alliances with Russia and Austria. But this period of pragmatic peace was coming to a close as the Ansbach violation signalled. By late November 1805, King Friedrich Wilhelm had made up his mind to go to war with France in support of the Third Coalition. Christian von Haugwitz, the former Prussian foreign minister, was dispatched from Berlin to give Napoleon this news directly. He carried in hand an ultimatum disguised as a peace offer. It was to be demanded of Napoleon that he cease the advance into Austria and withdraw back into France so that Prussia could organise a peace treaty. If he did not, Prussia would intervene on Austria's behalf. As this was taking place, Napoleon was still in Brunn with the army, caught between approaching coalition forces. With Charles racing up through Austria and Tsar Alexander encroaching on Austerlitz, it was easy for the Prussians to convince themselves that they had completely outplayed Napoleon. French victory at Austerlitz, therefore, was a shocking reality check. Days before, Prussian officers had been scraping their swords at the steps of the French embassy in Berlin. By December 2nd, the Prussians were falling over themselves to offer congratulations to the victor. Hagwitz actually met with Napoleon on November 28th before the battle and came perilously close to presenting Prussian demands. However, Napoleon had been briefed by Talleyrand and knew full well what was in the ultimatum. 
The tables were turned on Haugwitz. Napoleon spoke over him, borderline haranguing the Prussian, before dismissing him to Vienna for negotiations with Talleyrand. Four days later, Austerlitz was won, putting Haugwitz in a very awkward position. Having not actually technically delivered the ultimatum, Haugwitz had not committed Prussia to war. But if he was going to pull back from the brink, he would have to act fast. Praise was heaped on Napoleon for his brilliant victory. Ironically, the congratulations themselves were reworded from the original template meant for the Austrians. Haugwitz basically scratched Emperor Francis' name off and replaced it with Napoleon's. He made similar last-minute modifications to the Prussian ultimatum, which now omitted the promise of military intervention upon refusal. King Friedrich Wilhelm authorised these changes, but only after the fact, and he still insisted on a Prussian brokered peace between France and Austria. Angered by Prussian pretensions, Napoleon delayed the second audience with Haugwitz until December 15th. Eventually reconvening at Schönbrunn Palace, Haugwitz presented Prussia's offer to mediate a peace, which Napoleon flatly refused. The purpose of this meeting now became clear. Haugwitz was not there to deliver Prussian demands, but heed Napoleon's. The emperor offered a pre-written treaty of alliance between France and Prussia. The exchange of territories will form the basis of the agreement. Prussia was to cede Bayreuth and Ansbach to Bavaria. In exchange, France would reaffirm Prussian control of Hanover. These terms were generous beyond Haugwitz's wildest expectations. Prussia would lose a few bits of indefensible land in order to gain an alliance with Europe's dominant power. There was, however, one major downside. Napoleon demanded Prussia end her alliance with Britain immediately and close all ports to British trade. This demand seemed like a deal breaker at first. After all, Prussia had only a month before agreed to a renewed alliance with Britain. But with the strain that Prussia's retention of Hanover would no doubt put on their relationship, Hagwitz figured that the alliance had run its course. Better to side with an ascendant France than an isolated Britain. Pressing his advantage, and knowing that Hagwitz would soothe things over with Friedrich Wilhelm, Napoleon insisted the treaty be signed that day. Authorised to make such a call, Haugwitz agreed. The resulting Treaty of Schönbrunn prevented an open breach between Prussia and France that December. How long this peace might last was anyone's guess. For now though, the only fighting on the continent was confined to Italy. With Swedish units sticking to their bases in Strassland, not daring to test the French alone, the Italian front with Naples was the sole hotspot in Europe. Long had the obstinate Kingdom of Naples proved a thorn in Napoleon's side. The King of Naples, Ferdinando de Bourbon, was a pretty insipid character, but his wife, Queen Maria Carolina, was a staunch ally of Britain. On her authority, Royal Navy ships were based out of Neapolitan ports, and British goods continued to flow into Europe via these same ports. Overawed by French martial might, however, the King and Queen had been brought to the negotiating table in September 1805 where they submitted to a treaty of neutrality with France. The apparent peace gave Laurent Sancier's army of observation the cover needed to withdraw from along the Neapolitan border. When war broke out between France and Austria, Queen Maria Carolina showed her true loyalties, seizing the opportunity to ditch neutrality. She compelled the king to renege on the treaty and invited British and Russian troops into Naples. Like the Prussians, her hope was that Napoleon was surely doomed to lose against the superior Russo-Austrian army a misplaced hope if ever there was. Unencumbered after the Treaty of Pressburg, Napoleon dispatched André Messina and the Army of Italy to Naples. Disaster approaching, Maria Carolina protested that the 20,000-strong Anglo-Russian expeditionary force had invaded Naples without her consent, a bold-faced lie. When it became clear the French could not be dissuaded, Naples raised their army and manned the northern border. The one that won the Neapolitan army was hardly a match for the French. Supported by the British and the Russians, they stood a chance. That was until Naples' allies fled. The British had no interest in dying defending the border. Their interests were maritime. Russia too had suffered terrible losses in Bohemia, and so had zero appetite for risk. Shortages of supplies compounded these issues until, in January 1806, the Russians and British evacuated Naples completely. Queen Maria Carolina found herself standing alone as the sole object of Napoleon's wrath. Indeed, it would be safe to say Napoleon was extraordinarily pissed with Maria Carolina. In Napoleon's mind, he had been nothing but accommodating with Naples, forgiving their past intrigues in the interest of peace. This peace might have been self-serving for Napoleon, as it allowed him to focus entirely on Austria, but it is certainly the case that Naples had been double-dealing with French enemies. 
In his address to the Army of Italy as it marched on Naples, Napoleon invoked these many infractions. Soldiers, for ten years I have done everything I could to save the Kingdom of Naples, but their ruin is now sealed. After the battles of Digo, of Mondigo, of Lodi, they could have offered but the feeblest of resistance. I listened to promises of peace made by the King of Naples and treated him with generosity. When the Second Coalition was destroyed at Marengo, that king, first to wage an unjust war, remained isolated and defenceless. He implored me, and for the second time I pardoned him. Only a few months have passed since you were at the gates of Naples. I had good reason to suspect treason hatching there, and for avenging suffered insults. Again, I was generous. I permitted Naples to remain neutral. For the third time, the kingdom was spared. Shall there be a fourth time? Shall we trust a kingdom without honour, without sense? Never. The Bourbons of Naples have ceased to reign. Their continued rule is incompatible with European peace and the honour of my empire. So forward, soldiers. Hurl into the waves the feeble battalions of the British, tyrants of the seas. Send word that all of Italy the most lovely land in the world, is subject to my laws and freed from the yoke of that most perfidious of nations. Soldiers, my brother Joseph will lead you. He knows my plans. He carries my authority. He has my complete confidence. Guard him with yours. Though Napoleon had good reason to feel slighted by Naples, the righteous tone of this address shows that he was more than merely insulted. A nerve had been struck. As hinted in the address, This can be explained by Britain's heavy investment in Naples. Of all his enemies, Napoleon had never truly grappled with the British. They deluded him completely. So if he could do no real damage to their, quote, feeble battalions, he'd do the next best thing, inflict a crushing defeat upon their proxy, the Kingdom of Naples. Messina assumed command and marched out of Milan with 40,000 troops. Fanning out to occupy Naples, Messina besieged the port of Gaeta the main base of British naval operations in the central Mediterranean. The other two wings of the army made contact with the Neapolitans at Campo Tenesse. The entire Neapolitan army was destroyed, almost to a man. It would only be a matter of days before Naples itself was under siege, so seeing the writing on the wall, the king and queen fled to Sicily under the protection of the Union Jack. The conquest of Naples would drag on into December. British forays and a resistance by Neapolitan Lazzaroni partisans complicated an otherwise resounding victory. But aside from these few skirmishes in Naples, the guns had fallen silent across Europe. There was no better time then for Napoleon to embark on the next phase of his imperial project, to establish the Bonaparte family as a pan-European dynasty. We've already seen how Elisa Bonaparte was granted the Duchy of Luca Piombino, and before that, in 1804, how Eugène Bernhardt was made the Viceroy of Italy. With Naples shed of its king and queen, Napoleon now moved to add the kingdom to the Bonaparte de Menz. In December 1805, his older brother Joseph was chosen. By March the next year, he was king of Naples. Joseph was an uninspired choice for king. Joseph was reserved, unambitious, and narrowly concerned with his own legal and political pursuits. That's not to say he was a fool. Far from it, he was a competent statesman and diplomat. But then again, so were any number of statesmen and diplomats in French service. Though he'd been a meritocrat, sponsoring talented up-and-comers for civil and military service, for Napoleon, when considering who should rule in his empire, blood counted for far more than ability, a policy that would form the first fissure in the foundations of the French empire. A questionable choice in Naples was repeated a few months later in the Netherlands. The Batavian Republic, founded in 1795 as a French sister republic, had since then enjoyed a high level of autonomy and a golden age of political thought. But as early as 1800, the strains had been starting to show in the relationship. The Dutch rejected a version of Napoleon's constitution of year 8 for their republic. They did, however, accept a new executive, Grand Pensionary Rutger Schimmelpenick. Rutger was a French cipher and managed to quell most anti-French dissent, Though by 1804, this dissent reached critical levels, as Napoleon imposed increasingly outlandish demands on the Republic to provide more troops, more money, more supplies, and more ships for the war effort. Now in 1806, Rutger's health was failing, providing ideal pretext for Napoleon to swoop in and quite literally play the role of kingmaker. The Dutch government was offered a choice. They could reform into a monarchy, to be ruled by a Frenchman, or they would be annexed outright. 
annexation would mean war, and both sides knew it, but only Napoleon had the army to back it up. The Dutch submitted. On June 5th, the Batavian Republic was dissolved, reformed into the Kingdom of Holland. As with Naples, Napoleon made an uninspired decision to have one of his brothers take the Dutch throne. Unlike Joseph, Louis owed his successful career to Napoleon's ambition, and so he was often promoted well above his meagre abilities, with the ascension to the throne being the culmination of this artificially propelled career trajectory. There was no chance Louis would ever be a great ruler, but he might at least be a decent one. After being crowned a King of Holland in June 1806, he endeavoured to learn Dutch, which was more than most would do, and immersed himself in local affairs. By retaining Dutch ministers, Louis was also able to maintain good continuity in government, continuing policies begun by Rutger. Despite ruling in his own right, Louis was not truly sovereign. Holland remained tied at the hip to France. Napoleon expected that Louis, as his loyal brother, would do all he could to extract manpower and resources from Holland for the aggrandizement of France. Similar demands were made of Joseph. Napoleon expected both his brothers to rely upon their own resources, but at the same time, to follow his orders to the letter. In return, they could expect little in the way of financial or military assistance. Unsurprisingly, relations between the brothers strained to the point of mutual acrimony. In one telling letter, a pained Joseph said that his brother Napoleon, as he once knew him, was dead, that they would only again meet in death, quote, in the fields of Elysium. Napoleon's response? To brutalise Joseph for naivete, and forever believing that their feelings for each other would not change over time. Fraternal fallouts occupied only some of Napoleon's time. He returned to France in early 1806 to deal with domestic political and economic issues. There will be some major developments stemming from this eight-month period from January to October. Here, Napoleon inaugurates the continental system, writes the French economy, and begins the imperial peerage system. For now, though, we're going to stick with the grander diplomatic happenings. Napoleon's great concern now was to solidify French domination in Germany, just like it achieved in Italy and the Netherlands. The first logical step was to ensure the alliances with Bavaria, Württemberg, and Baden. Having received generous portions of imperial land at Pressburg, these German allies were more than satisfied with the French. But how long would such goodwill last? To form the basis for a more permanent friendship, Napoleon settled upon making a series of dynastic marriages to bind the fate of his German allies to the fortunes of imperial France. The newly created King of Bavaria, Maximilian I, was very keen to tie the knot with France. In January, he broke off a prearranged marriage of his eldest daughter, Princess Augusta, to the Prince of Baden in favour of Napoleon's proposed marriage to Eugène Beauharnais. Maximilian and Napoleon were chuffed at the arrangement. The only parties unsure were the bride and groom themselves. Eugene would have to make a new home in Munich with a woman he'd never met, and Augusta was understandably worried by such a major change in plans. Reservations aside, on January 13th, Eugene and Augusta were married. The first few months of this marriage didn't fare too well, and Eugene returned without delay to his work in Milan as viceroy. So in April, Napoleon gave Eugene some advice in a letter, asking him to take a break and spend some personal time with Augusta. Clearly, the advice was heeded, Within a few months, Augusta was pregnant with a daughter. Born in March 1807, Napoleon ordered the infant be named Josephine in honour of her grandmother. More wedding bells would ring that same year. Stéphanie de Beauharnais, the cousin of Queen Josephine, was married off to the recently unengaged Prince of Baden, Karl Ludwig. They say opposite to tract. Stéphanie was a French socialite and Karl Ludwig a stuffy nobleman, so the two should have been an ideal pairing. It was not so. There was little Napoleon could do for the prince, but he did write to Stephanie insisting she become accustomed to Germany and forget Parisian luxuries which, quote, you know perfectly well you can't enjoy. Stephanie appears to have ignored this advice and sought to recreate Paris in Karlsruhe. She lived a life of luxury and opulence while Karl Ludwig spent most of his time travelling and whoring. It wasn't until 1811 that the two settled down. Quite the opposite was Jerome Bonaparte, the youngest of the brothers. It had been nearly five years since he married the love of his life, Elizabeth Patterson, an American socialite. Napoleon was furious at this match and did all he could to impede the couple. By 1807, Napoleon had succeeded in attaining a papal annulment of the marriage. Reluctant pawn in his brother's ambitions, Jerome finally agreed to marry Princess Katharina of Württemberg in August. Where marriage secured relations with Bavaria, Württemberg and Baden, 
Napoleon employed a far more novel diplomatic solution to secure alliances with the remaining German states. Long had the Rhine been a natural border for France, marking the eastward extent of their influence and territory. Temporarily, France might see some German territory or sway German rulers, but these gains never lasted long. Perhaps the earliest serious attempt at making permanent French influence in Germany was the League of the Rhine, an alliance network founded by Cardinal Mazarin in the 1650s. Building on relations established with Protestant German states during the Thirty Years' War, France maintained a diplomatic bulwark against the Spanish and Austrians. More recently, during the Revolutionary Wars, the French Republic had been in control of chunks of Rhineland territory, much of it on the eastern bank. As part of the Committee of Public Safety's policy of war feeding itself, French administrators and bureaucrats had moved in to extract wealth for the Republic. At the same time, though, they also introduced French law, ended the feudal system, and promoted free trade. By the time the French were rejected, the pains of forced requisition were fading into memory, but the legal and administrative benefits of French occupation were taken as inspiration. Leveraging this influence in the Rhineland, Napoleon formed a new client state. Under French guarantee, 16 sovereign states, from duchies to counties to kingdoms, federated as the Confederation of the Rhine. Despite its name, the Confederation was not geographically constrained, and Napoleon had no trouble convincing Bavaria, Baden, and Württemberg to join. Even the Kingdom of Saxony, right in the middle of Germany, joined the Confederation. Deserted now by the German states, Austria's privileged position in German affairs wasn't just damaged, it was annihilated. The foundation of the Confederation of the Rhine heralded the final end of the Holy Roman Empire because as a condition of entry to the Confederation, all client states were immediately required to withdraw from the Empire. In many ways, this change is more significant in hindsight. The Holy Roman Empire had existed for just over a thousand years, since Pope Leo's coronation of Charlemagne in 800 CE. And yet its dissolution was not marked by conflict, but merely a knowing shrug. The Empire had been in severe decline for decades, suffering mostly from a lack of purpose. Supporters, mostly in the imperial cities, would claim that the empire existed to protect the rights and territory of all the German states, from within and from without. Detractors, like those in Bavaria, Baden, Württemberg, and even Prussia, would claim that an empire which only served Austrian interests could not possibly serve the interests of all German members. Indeed, it was Austrian interests which were most closely served by the empire. Through imperial institutions, Habsburg influence extended across all of Germany, right down to the local level. Still, it was an immense burden, both militarily and financially. Treaty bound to protect the territorial integrity of Germany, Austria had taken on outsized responsibilities in combating the great powers of Europe in arduous wars, often fought at the same time against multiple foes. Fighting from Hungary to Holland, from Silesia to Savoy, Austria had spent much of the 1700s perilously overextended. Defeat at Prussian hands during the Silesian Wars permanently tarnished Austria's reputation among the imperial princes and electors, so much so that by the 1790s, only the weakened imperial cities defended Austrian prerogatives. Mediatization from 1803 to 1805 had then annexed these cities to their larger neighbours, so that now, as Napoleon forms the Confederation of the Rhine, there is not a single state in Germany that rose to Austria's defence. And why would they? Austria had proven incapable of defeating the French Republic and now the French Empire, thereby failing in their mission to maintain German integrity. For the German states, the path forward now ran through Paris, not Vienna. Far better to grow at Austria's expense, seizing more land and money while under the protection of the French Empire. So rather than fight Napoleon to maintain his dying empire, a thrice-defeated Emperor Francis II meekly accepted its end. The Confederation of the Rhine was inaugurated on July 27, 1806. About a week later, Francis officially dissolved the Holy Roman Empire. He would, however, remain an emperor, a face-saving courtesy arranged by Talleyrand. The Archduchy of Austria was now the Empire of Austria, Francis II, now Emperor Franz I. The dissolution of the empire is one of the most important events in European history, certainly in German history because we're now well on the road to German unification. The trend of territorial rationalization, first started in 1803 with mediatization, has now been accelerated. And as the various minor German states grow, so too do their ambitions and capabilities. With Austria's influence collapsed and Prussia isolated, states like Bavaria, Baden, Saxony and others are no longer satellites in a bipolar Germany, but equal players, 
solid middle powers able to compete as relative equals. Representing this shakeup in leadership, Napoleon appointed a German from outside of Austria or Prussia to lead the Confederation of the Rhine. Karl Dahlborg was from Mainz, having recently served as the Arch-Chancellor of the now-defunct Empire. As a notable supporter of Napoleon and a proven diplomat, Dahlborg was elevated to the role of Fürst Primus of the Confederation of the Rhine. Of course, though a German governed, the Confederation was a client state of the French Empire. Heavy demands were placed on the Confederation, especially in military terms. All told, the Confederation of the Rhine contributed around 63,000 fully equipped and trained soldiers. Regiments were folded into the existing structure of La Grande Armée. Additional requisitions of supplies, manpower, horses, weapons, quite literally anything the army might need, were also regularly demanded of the Confederation. Both the end of the Holy Roman Empire and the formation of the Confederation of the Rhine were big splashes in the German pond, and it wasn't long before the ripples were felt in Berlin. Before the Confederation, Prussia was a major player in German affairs, enjoying long-standing ties to the various German states. Now that most were unified under the Confederation, these treaties were rendered null and void. Prussia's diplomatic influence in Germany evaporated in a flash. Silver lining was that Austria, Prussia's only German rival, was out of the game, but France had essentially taken Austria's place. So instead of finding themselves as the biggest fish in the German pond, Prussia was swimming alone and staring down a much bigger France. Technically, France and Prussia were allies as per the Treaty of Schönbrunn, and this basic framework kept the peace for a few months. But calm waters belied the turmoil underneath the surface. King Friedrich Wilhelm wanted desperately to claw Prussia's way back to hegemony in Germany, and to do that, he'd have to get out from under the alliance with France. From January to about June, this seemed like a pipe dream. Russia was on the verge of making peace with France, as was Great Britain. What's more, La Grande Armée was stationed in Bavaria just in case Prussia really did get up to any mischief. But that wasn't too likely just now, as the hawkish von Hardenburg was replaced as Prussian foreign minister by Haugwitz. Part of the deal struck at Schönbrunn was that Friedrich Wilhelm would oust the hawks from his court and surround himself with doves like Haugwitz, who were committed to the peace. Well, that was the deal on paper. In practice, Friedrich Wilhelm still took advice from old Hardenburg, from Queen Louise, and other hawks. They assured him that war was coming, and Prussia had to be proactive. Counsel like this was brought back to reality by Haugwitz, who had a much clearer view of Prussia's perilous situation. He knew well that in spite of all the diplomatic niceties, Napoleon did not trust Prussia. They were still allied with Russia, who was still at war with France, so from Napoleon's perspective it looked like Prussia was hedging their bets. He predicted that Napoleon would try to force the issue. Haugwitz was spot on. At first, Napoleon ordered Marshal Berthier to relocate the army to near Ansbach, the Prussian exclave now annexed to Bavaria. This deliberately inflammatory move didn't budge the Prussians, though, but a line was crossed when Napoleon began to test Prussian resolve by expanding French influence into Saxony and then Hesse. Both of these regions directly abutted Prussia, and the Hohenzollerns had strong dynastic ties to both the Hessian and Saxon nobility. Haugwitz interpreted Napoleon's probes as a violation of the status quo as they extended French presence beyond their spheres of influence along the Rhine and the Danube. Alarm bells rang in Berlin, as these moves were widely interpreted as a prelude to war, further emboldening the hawks. It's hard to say exactly what Napoleon's intentions were at this time. One minute, in council meetings or letters to Berthier and Talleyrand, the emperor decried the Prussians as duplicitous, untrustworthy, and warmongering. Certainly, the kind of rhetoric that might justify a war. The next minute, Napoleon was praising Prussia, especially its military, widely regarded as the finest in Europe. Echoing Voltaire's quip that Prussia was, quote, an army with a state, Napoleon joked that Prussia was, quote, hatched from a cannonball. Despite this healthy respect for Prussia, Napoleon's diplomatic maneuvers in 1806 were certainly quite aggressive. If his aim was to goad Prussia into war, this would be the way to go about it. But at the same time, there was no real reason to go back to war. Too many domestic issues had been left to fester while Napoleon was away on campaign, so he now spent long days at Malmaison or the Tuileries, rectifying issues stretching from relations with the Pope to cemetery expansion in Paris. So why then, if Napoleon does not want war, did he provoke Prussia? Well, it seems to be because he believed he was in a stronger position, and so overplayed his hand. 
It might also be said that Napoleon underestimated Prussian willingness to fight when the chips were down. After July of 1806, the emboldened pro-war faction represented the broad consensus of the Prussian elite. There was Queen Louise, of course, always spoiling for a fight, and she was now joined by Friedrich Louis von Hörnler, a prince of the Prussian nobility. Speaking for the army was Karl Wilhelm Ferdinand, better known to us as the Duke of Brunswick. Despite this consensus, ultimately, Prussia's path would be decided by the king. So, playing to Friedrich Wilhelm's anxiety over Hanover, the Hawks whispered to him that Napoleon intended to return the territory to Britain to make good their not-so-secret peace deal. The offer was nothing more than a bit of wrangling. The British had no interest in reuniting with indefensible Hanover, but it was more than enough to convince Friedrich Wilhelm that France had to be stopped. Paul Haugwitz was booted out and Hardenborg reappointed as foreign minister. In this capacity, he rekindled Prussia's friendship with both Russia and Britain. Quite by chance, diplomatic developments after July made this reproach more quite easy. France's negotiations with the British were taking place in London. Despite auspicious beginnings, Charles James Fox fell seriously ill on August 9th, depriving Prime Minister Grenville of his most passionate advocate for peace, and France of an amiable negotiator whom Henri Clark and the other French diplomats found eminently reasonable. The bones of Fox's treaty were still on the table, but the proposal fizzled as both sides waited too long. Grenville's government was growing increasingly unpopular and lacked parliamentary support. Napoleon, meanwhile, was waiting anxiously to see if Fox recovered. He did not. Fox died on September 13th, causing Napoleon to regret that he was, quote, mourned by two nations. With Fox died any hopes of peace, and Granville's government wasn't too long for this world either, collapsing in the elections of March 1807. So though Britain and Prussia weren't on the best of terms, and indeed Britain had seized Prussian shipping in retaliation for Schönbrunn, the failure of the peace with France assured British support for Prussia in the long run. Where an earnest attempt to make peace with Britain failed through circumstance, France's efforts to make peace with Russia failed due to a bit of bungling. Negotiations with Russia immediately after Austerlitz failed to coax Tsar Alexander into admitting defeat, though he did signal a willingness to strike some sort of deal. In the meantime, the military situation remained static, with Russian troops regrouping in Poland and the French army sticking to Germany. As we saw though, Russia did still pose some threat to Italy. They'd leased ports in the Ionian Islands as a base in the Mediterranean from which to intervene in Naples. So in order to deprive Russia of this base, Napoleon turned to the Ottoman Empire for assistance. Soldier statesman Horace Sebastiani leveraged his superb relations with the Sublime Port to propose a joint Franco-Turkish attack on Russia. The details were hazy, but the Sultan showed just enough interest to worry Tsar Alexander that he might be waging yet another expensive war in the Balkans and the Caucasus. For the French, this was just business, a backup plan in case the peace didn't pan out, and there was no reason to think anything was amiss. On July 20th, the Russian envoy to Paris, Pyotr Yakovlevich Ubri, finalised an alliance treaty that would end the war. It only required Alexander's signature to go into effect. But Penn never touched paper as Alexander fumed at French intrigues in Istanbul, refusing to make peace with any two-faced Frenchman. Though Britain and Russia were now re-inclined to support Prussia, no party made any firm commitments. The Russian army stayed put, and the British didn't open up the money taps for the Prussians. Still, Friedrich Wilhelm was quite confident he had the measure of the French. The Prussian army was strong, and Antoine de la Forêt, the French ambassador to Prussia, was tripping over himself with offerings of peace and harmony between Paris and Berlin, a clear sign of weakness. By August 7th at the latest, the king had determined to go to war with France. He lacked only for a strong casus belli. Fortunately for him, circumstances were once again to play to Prussian favour. With the formation of the Confederation of the Rhine, French law was adopted in many areas of Germany. Larger members like Bavaria and Saxony maintained their own legal independence, but smaller states, especially along the Rhine, had been under French control for over a decade and were long exposed to French legalism. This law was revolutionary in origin, and despite many regressions since then, French law was still significantly freer and fairer than any German legal code. The Code Napoléon in particular was a popular rallying point for German intellectuals and liberals who were keen advocates of French thought. On the face of it, these developments were all to French advantage, galvanising ties between the French Empire and its German sphere. But there were unanticipated consequences too. 
For though many Germans supported French law for its modernism and rationalism, others supported it because it represented a fine legal model for an independent German state. Quite unintentionally, by forming the Confederation of the Rhine, Napoleon had jump-started German nationalism. Freedom of assembly and freedom of the press triggered an explosion of pamphlets and treatises in favour of German nationhood. The character of this nationalism was entirely liberal and positive, emphasising the similarity of shared German language and culture, decrying Prussian, Austrian and of course French domination. As such, the movement was entirely intellectual and confined to the private sphere. Certainly no government or institution advocated unification. But Napoleon was worried all the same. Perhaps he heard in Germany echoes of the French Revolution, or maybe he felt that any disunity in the Confederation of the Rhine would undermine France's influence. Whatever it was, Napoleon was alarmed, and in his alarm, overreacted very badly. A German bookseller by the name of Johann Palm was in Napoleon's crosshairs. Owning a small publishing business in Nuremberg, Palm was just one of dozens of publishers of nationalist literature, but he was singled out because he refused to grasp on the anonymous writers of the books he published. This was such an incredibly minor issue, that once Napoleon caught wind of it, he blew it right out of proportion. Berthier was ordered to arrest Palm and bring him to trial. Berthier complied, capturing Palm at Branau on August 25th. After refusing to budge under intense questioning, a tribunal found Palm guilty of libel. He was promptly executed by shooting. It was a pointless, unwarranted, and horrific crime on Napoleon's part. Clearly, no lessons had been learned since 1804 and the similarly counterproductive execution of the Duc d'Angion. As with the murder of Angion, Napoleon clearly underestimated the impact of Palm's murder. Rather than silence German liberals and nationalists, their invectives took on a new life, with Palm invoked as the first martyr for a unified Germany. Anti-French reaction in the Confederation soon spread to Prussia. The timing could not have been more serendipitous for the Hawks. On the same day as Palm's execution, August 26th, Friedrich Wilhelm was putting his signature to an ultimatum directed at the French. Cited were the dozens of infractions and provocations of the previous months, Palm's demise was simply added in the postscript as Napoleon's most recent indiscretion. If the French did not withdraw west of the Rhine before October, there would be war. When the ultimatum appeared on Napoleon's desk a few days later, he believed it was a bluff. Surely Friedrich Wilhelm was not serious. The only possible explanation in Napoleon's mind was that somehow, without Talleyrand or Fouché discovering it, Prussia had made some sort of secret pact with the Austrians, Russians or the British. It explained at once Prussia's confidence and why the British and Russians had withdrawn so quickly from their peace talks with France. Wanting peace, Napoleon now had to play his cards very close to his chest, appearing neither too strong nor too weak. On September 5th, he met with the Prussian ambassador in Paris, Count Gerolamo Lucassini, to make French intentions clear. I assure you, sir, I always carry my heart on my sleeve. I shall undertake a war against Prussia, but only for the honour of France and the security of my allies. If your young officers and women at Berlin want war, they shall have it. I am prepared to satisfy them. Clearly, through Talleyrand and Laforet, Napoleon was well abreast of the bellicose intent of Queen Louise, Brunswick and the rest. Still, peace with Prussia was in France's interest, and Napoleon did wish to talk Friedrich Wilhelm back from the precipice. Quite possibly, the king did briefly lose his nerve at this 11th hour. That, or he wished to lull Napoleon into a false sense of security. He sent a letter to Napoleon assuring him of continued goodwill. Eager to accept the sentiment, Napoleon replied that he was grateful to have the king's true feelings made clear, and that if swords were drawn, quote, it will be with the greatest regret. Hearts began to harden in favour of war, however, as September elapsed. Friedrich Wilhelm eagerly accepted the advice of the Hawks, who assured him that France, despite appearances, was vulnerable. All it would take was one lightning strike to eject the French and secure all of Germany for Prussia. In fact, so confident were the Prussians that the alliances with Russia and Britain were not renewed, despite friendly ties. Neither were the reserves mobilised. Prussia was planning for a quick and decisive war, a move which in hindsight smacks of hubris. But the Prussians did have good reason to fancy their chances in a straight-up contest. The Prussian army was renowned as the best in Europe, a potent melding of impeccable drill and clockwork precision. This was, after all, the army of Friedrich the Great, who had led this force to victory in the Silesian Wars. 
It was a proud martial legacy that was claimed not merely by King Friedrich Wilhelm, but also the officers of the Prussian military. Von Friedberg, Hockkirk, Rosbach, these were the names etched in glory in the minds of the Junkers who clamoured for war. Rosbach was a name etched in French memory too, but for entirely opposite reasons. Napoleon knew chapter and verse the circumstances of France's most humiliating defeat of the 18th century. Overconfidence had contributed to the French defeat then, and Napoleon would not make the same mistake now in 1806. So in the best tradition of hoping for the best but planning for the worst, France was readied for war. A great deal of time and energy was spent in assessing the capability of the Prussian army. Experts and spy reports detailed Prussian tactics and organisation. Based on historical knowledge and these reports, Napoleon's estimation of the Prussian army overall was very high, though several flaws were identified. For starters, their tactics were now badly outdated. Prussian drill was still based on Friedrich the Great's innovations of the 1740s. Precision and discipline were emphasised to the exclusion of speed and flexibility. Officers, especially junior officers, were not expected to improvise. Instead, they were to execute on precise orders at precise times. As such, the whole Prussian army moved at a snail's pace. This sluggishness exacerbated by over-provisioning, which bogged down the army with long baggage trains. Still, in a stand-up fight, the Prussians would give any foe a run for their money, after a slow march of course. No, the chronic defect at the heart of the Prussian army was not tactical, but rather a pervasive culture of conservatism. As we've seen with the veneration of the old over the new, the Prussian army did not value innovation or modernization. In the words of military historian David Chandler, the Prussians were ensnared by, quote, the cult of the past. This slavish adherence to the past most keenly affected Prussian organization and leadership. The Duke of Brunswick was nominally in overall command, though supreme command belonged to King Friedrich Wilhelm. Keenly aware that it was not cut from the same cloth as old Friedrich the Great, Friedrich Wilhelm acted upon this inadequacy by insisting upon being involved in all military decision making, slowing everything down to a crawl. Below Brunswick was a gaggle of Junkers, all of whom were well into their 60s. Some, like Brunswick, were well into their 70s. This meant that many had actually served with Friedrich the Great, or at least officers of his generation which counted for far more in the Prussian army than any kind of competency. Vicard von Merlendorf was one of these greybeards. A general Feldmarschall responsible for military administration, von Merlendorf was Prussia's anchor to the past, his conservatism keeping the army from modernising or adapting. Emblematic of Merlendorf's atavism, the Prussians had no staff system. It was one of France's greatest military attributes, but the Prussians relied solely upon a brain's trust of three generals to act as chiefs of staff, in Prussian nomenclature, the Oberkriegskollegium. Karl Ludwig von Fuhr was an unremarkable man, who owed his high position to nepotism, not talent. Karl Christian von Marsenbach was, by contrast, a theoretician. For some strange reason, he was referred to as the evil genius. Perhaps it was ironic, as Marsenbach's ideas swung wildly from the completely by the books to utterly insane. Gerhard von Scharnhorst was also a theoretician, but not one so hidebound to tradition as his peers. In fact, Scharnhorst was one of the few honest-to-God reformers in the Prussian army. Together, these three generals were responsible for war planning, for organisation, and for keeping the army supplied. Three men, and they didn't even have proper staffs to support their work. By comparison, the French Grand Quartier General Imperial, or the Imperial General Headquarters, was a multidisciplined and highly organised hierarchy, covering every conceivable function of the army during both war and peace. This function at the staff level extended to the field. When on campaign, Prussian forces were divided into armies, and on paper there were three field armies, the Army of the East, the Army of the West, and the Army of the Centre. This need to keep three separate armies reflected Prussia's unenviable geographical conundrum, with powerful enemies to their east, west and south. With Russia a friend since the 1750s, the eastern flank was nowhere near as vital as it once was. But rather than now reinforce the western centre, the Prussians still made sure the east took pride of place. This is because the eastern army, based in East Prussia and Poland, was traditionally the mainstay of the Junkers, whose estates and titles were concentrated in the east. The Western Army, by contrast, was the smallest and weakest, despite being closest to France, Russia's only European enemy since 1792. The character of the Western force skewed slightly more middle class and young when compared to the retirement home out east. 
the Central Army too was a bit of a mix of young and old. In the days of Friedrich the Great, this was the army poised to range south to combat the Austrians. Of course, during the Revolutionary Wars, this army's purpose no longer existed, as Austria was an ally. But rather than break up this army, redistributing its regiments, as ever, the Prussians stuck rigidly to tradition. The army of the centre not only remained intact, but was enlarged in both size and importance. Really, taking a look at the strategic outlook here in 1806, you'd be forgiven for thinking Prussia was about to invade Silesia or Bohemia again. As such, the entire Prussian military was out of position when King Friedrich Wilhelm made his determination to go to war in early August. It took weeks for the Army of the East to be gathered and then marched to Berlin. And even so, massive garrisons were still maintained on the border with Russia. Of a total of 254,000 Prussian troops deployed, 70,000 stayed behind in Prussia, many of them on the border with Russia. Still, at 170,000 soldiers, the three Prussian field armies actually slightly outnumbered the French in Germany. So victory assured, the question now was who would lead the Prussian armies. There was a lot of bickering and infighting over who would get which assignments. Brunswick secured for himself the top gig as commander of the Army of the Center, joined by Wilhelm von Schmettau as his chief of staff. Reinforced to 70,000 troops, the army marched out of Berlin and Magdeburg in early September. Friedrich Ludwig, Prince of Hörnler, took command of the 50,000 strong Army of the East. Hörnler himself was a career soldier and not a bad pick for commander, though he was known to have a short fuse. General Marsenbach was there as his chief of staff, as much to keep Hörnler on an even keel as to actually manage operations. Bearing the least prestige, few of the Junkers were interested in being stationed out west. Therefore, something remarkable happened. The Prussians actually made a good personnel decision for a change. Command was granted to a capable, if brash, general, Gerhard von Blücher. Blücher's name is famous now, but at the time he was exceedingly lucky to have been given this assignment. A tough, if uncreative fighter, General Blücher was well aware of his many shortcomings, and so surrounded himself with talent. Officers, otherwise ignored by the more established Junkers, found the old Swedes campaign tent always open. It was for this reason that Scharnhorst joined Blücher on campaign as his chief of staff. The diminutive army of the West had only 30,000 soldiers, but it was by far the best organised and best prepared when war broke out, largely thanks to Scharnhorst. Reports from spies, scouts and diplomats kept Napoleon up to date on the Prussian deployment. At this stage, these movements still looked precautionary, so the Emperor remained unconvinced that Prussia would actually take the plunge. It took the sudden withdrawal on September 3rd of the Tsar's envoy, Count Ubri, that war was indeed at hand. So taking stock, Napoleon considered his options. Despite Prussian sluggishness, they determined to go to war a whole month earlier. For the French, this now meant a seriously truncated mobilisation. Already, the bulk of La Grande Armée, at 160,000 soldiers, was still stationed in Germany. Problem was that the various corps and divisions and regiments were completely dispersed along the Rhine, the Danube and the River Main. Worse still, Napoleon didn't yet know where to concentrate his forces. That would depend on where the Prussians themselves decided to concentrate. Would they gather in Westphalia for a drive on the Rhine, or mass in Hesse for an attack into Franconia? Hell, could Vienna and Berlin be conspiring? Could the Prussians be readying to march into Bohemia to aid the Austrians? Putting himself in his opponent's position, Napoleon predicted that it would be in central Germany, probably around Thuringia and Saxony, that the campaign unfolded. Therefore, this would have to be where the French army concentrated. Having already anticipated this might be the case, Marshal Berthier was already stationed in the area in the city of Bamberg. On September 5th, he received the first flurry of orders from Napoleon giving shape to the coming campaign. To open, every available horseman was to be sent to scout the terrain leading from Bamberg into Saxony. Engineers too were instructed to reconnoitre bridges and roads in preparation for the army's advance. Beltier also directed Napoleon's order to the corps to prepare themselves for forced marching. Meanwhile, back in France, the 50,000 strong class of 1806 was called up alongside 30,000 reservists. Subsequent reports from French spies noted that the Prussians were mostly moving south out of Berlin, enough to convince Napoleon that the Prussians weren't planning to, say, march on Holland or strike into the Rhineland. But that didn't mean he knew precisely when or where the Prussians would strike, save that the campaign would be fought in central Germany. What was for certain was that the war couldn't be won from Paris. 
Napoleon had to get out into the field. Under the watchful eye of Coulencourt, preparations for the Emperor's departure were shrouded in subterfuge. Officially, he was leaving for a diet to be hosted at Frankfurt, but rather than be accompanied by an imperial retinue of diplomats and counsellors, Napoleon travelled light. He directed that his campaign tent be stout, not large, and able to fit on a single wagon. All of his field glasses were refurbished too, and then most importantly, eight swift horses requisitioned from the imperial stables. Their speed and endurance would be needed in the coming weeks. As this was going on, it was business as usual for Napoleon. Council meetings carried on as normal, as were diplomatic overtures to the Prussians. There was, however, an unmistakable charge in the air. Paris was abuzz with rumour that war was days away, as though it had not been all but confirmed by the general mobilisation. Tension was not much to Napoleon's style, but frustration was. In a very one-sided correspondence with his brother Joseph, Napoleon vented his anger in a letter sent on September 12th. Prussia is arming and manoeuvring in a brazen manner. They will, however, soon disarm, or be made to suffer dearly for it. Nothing could be more foolish and more hesitating than the conduct of the Prussian government. Meanwhile, the court of Vienna makes great offerings of supplication, and given Austria's extreme weakness, I do believe them. Whatever happens, I can and will face it all. I may possibly take command of La Grande Armée in a few days. I have around 150,000 soldiers, enough to crush Vienna, Berlin and St. Petersburg. But if I do take to the field once more, Europe shall understand that I only do so to complete the destruction of my enemies. Despite his unbridled disdain for the Prussian government and its king, Napoleon was very wary of its army. Keen not to play into Prussian hands, he delayed as long as possible in deciding where La Grande Armée should concentrate. If the Prussians attacked first, as seemed quite plausible, a concentration along the Main River at Würzburg or even Mainz was ideal. There was even thought to pull back into Bavaria or even the Rhineland. But in typical Napoleonic fashion, the Emperor was cautious in his planning, but aggressive in practice. He confirmed Bamberg as the concentration point for La Grande Armée, not merely because Berthier was already there, but because Bamberg was closest to the likely front lines. The wisdom of this choice was borne out only three days later, because it was on September 18th that the Prussians crossed the border into the Kingdom of Saxony. Prince Hörnler marched into Dresden with the entire Army of the East. A few days later, Brunswick had arrived in Leipzig. Further north, Blücher and the Army of the West took up the rearguard at Göttingen. Though one surprised that the Prussians had chosen Saxony as their gathering point, Napoleon was still shocked by the audacity. Since Saxony was a French protectorate by treaty with the Confederation of the Rhine, this was effectively an open act of war. And yet, there was no official declaration. Worse still, the Saxons had sided with the Prussians over France. 22,000 Saxon soldiers, promised by treaty to France, instead joined Hohenlohe's army at Dresden. With Prussia's hand revealed, Napoleon could begin the campaign. From September 18th to the 19th, Napoleon, or more accurately his staff, unleashed a hailstorm of orders on the Grande Armée. They reached Berthier on the 20th, and in a gargantuan effort, he successfully conveyed fully 102 separate orders to the various corps and divisions. By October 4th, they were all expected to be in position, ready to receive the green light. Michel Ney's 6th Corps was already at Bamberg with Berthier, to be joined by Nicolas de Vu's 3rd Corps, marching north out of Nördlingen and Bavaria. To their northwest, around Bad Königshofen, would amass the 5th Corps of François Lefebvre. Pierre Augereau's 7th Corps was nearby, stationed at Frankfurt am Main. Near Nuremberg was Jean-Baptiste Bernadotte's 1st Corps. Jean Soule's 4th Corps was to be stationed a few miles east at Hamburg. The French Imperial Guard, meanwhile, had departed Paris on September 19th. They arrived in Mainz on September 27th, having covered 550 kilometres in just over a week. A truly astounding feat of endurance. In the interest of securing France from attack, Napoleon also ordered that the National Guard be placed on alert. So too was General Guillaume Bonn's army reinforced in case the British made a descent. And though Austria was tapped on strength, unwilling to fight, Napoleon couldn't be absolutely sure that they would stick to the terms of Pressburg. Eugene, down in the Kingdom of Italy, was therefore ordered to mobilise the Italian army, and if need be, join Marmont's 2nd Corps in a march on Vienna. 
Like clockwork, Le Grand Armée swung into action, force marching to their concentrations. To mask these movements, Napoleon planned to menace Prussia from the west in conjunction with his brother Louis. To coincide with the concentration of Le Grand Armée by October 4th, on October 1st, the 30,000 strong Dutch army was to advance as if intending to invade Hanover. This would hopefully alarm the Prussians, who might now have to consider Westphalia to be a secondary theatre of operations. But Napoleon still fully intended to make the main effort in central Germany. By September 19th, he had a good idea of what exactly he wanted to accomplish. The goal was to knock Prussia out of the fight as rapidly as possible, before Russia could intervene. To achieve this, Napoleon planned to march on Berlin, but between the Prussian capital and Bamberg were the three Prussian armies in Saxony. Plans to simply go around Saxony had little to recommend them. If the French advanced via Westphalia, they'd be taking the longest possible route to Berlin. An advance from Main through Fulda and the German plain would be shorter, but allow the Prussians to retire at their own pace into friendly territory. So instead of going around Saxony, Napoleon decided to go straight through, the idea being to engage the Prussians decisively. Starting from Bayreuth and Bamberg, the French would advance north through Saxony. This would force the Prussians to make a choice, to either stand and fight or retreat north. A retreat north was one thing, and if that happened, Napoleon would reassess. Far more likely, though, was that the Prussians would make a stand. And this would put them in a nasty bind, because between the two main Prussian concentrations, one at Leipzig and one in Dresden, were the crisscrossing obstacles of Saxony's rivers, the Elbe, the Saale, and the Elster, all of which would be tricky to cross. Delayed by the rivers, it was Napoleon's conviction that Brunswick would be too late to save Hohenlohe before he was crushed by the overwhelming momentum of the French Cascade. As ever, Napoleon's plan was deceptively simple. The complexities and creativity would arise more so in the execution. On the opposite side of the lines, though, neither creativity nor simplicity were evident in any Prussian plans. Brunswick had convened his first council of war way back in early September, and immediately disharmony undercut the Prussian staff. Predictably, the most sensible strategy was proposed by Scharnhorst, who urged a fighting retreat towards Silesia that allowed the Russians to intervene. None of the other senior generals accepted Scharnhorst's proposal, not for any sound military reason, mind, but because they felt a Fabian strategy of delay and withdrawal beneath Prussian dignity. No, the Prussian officers instead broadly agreed to go on the attack, but none could agree on an axis of advance. The initial offensive plan, put forth by Brunswick, was the most obvious, an attack towards Frankfurt to outflank the French. If the Prussians were fast enough, they could catch the French out of position. But Prince Hörnler did not concur. Ever the hothead, he proposed the far more blunt strategy of a direct approach via Franconia. In telling portents for things to come, despite being in command, Brunswick struggled to defend his plan against Hohenlohe's sheer force of will, thus paralysing Prussian command. For weeks, counterplans or tweaks were discussed and discarded. This included a characteristically ridiculous plan from Marsenbach to make a feint towards the Danube with the entire army and then double back to Prussia. By about September 22nd or so, Brunswick was finally able to get most of his plan agreed to. At which point, King Friedrich Wilhelm waded in to offer his own sage military advice. He presented a tortured combination of both Brunswick and Hohenlohe's plan, taking the main points from both. This pointless compromise couldn't have been more damaging. At once, it delayed Prussian plans and severely undermined the command authority of Brunswick. Beyond that, the compromise took no account of French movements, because in the time it had taken for the Prussians to actually sort things out, the French were rearing to go. The Emperor arrived in Mainz on the morning of September 28th, accompanied by Josephine and Talleyrand. A few last-minute bits of business were cleared up here, final orders were sent to Louis and Eugene, and the progress of the cause double-checked. Then, after a meeting with the King of Württemberg, Napoleon quit Mainz and followed the Main River down to Würzburg, arriving on October 2nd. Even at this 11th hour, it wasn't impossible, however unlikely, that war could be averted. Neither the Prussians nor the French had officially declared war, and Ambassador Laforet remained in Berlin trying to hash out a compromise. His pleas were in vain, however. He reported that Friedrich Wilhelm had dispatched an envoy who presumably was carrying the declaration of war. 
rather than deliver the declaration directly to Napoleon, the envoy took his sweet time in traversing Germany, finally getting to Paris on October 2nd. The declaration turned out to be yet another final ultimatum, demanding a French withdrawal from Germany. Included too was a demand that Prussia be free to form their own confederation of German states. Despite the diplomatic language, Friedrich Wilhelm never intended for the ultimatum to be accepted. Consent was required by October 8th, and Napoleon only learned of the contents the day before. By then it was far too late to sheathe swords, because the French advance was already well underway. At the tip of the spear were the colourful hussars and brass-clad dragoons of Murat's cavalry division, who crossed into Thuringia on October 1st. In standby position from Babberg to Bayreuth was the rest of La Grande Armée. They were arrayed in three large columns behind the Main River, in a bataillon carré formation. On the left flank was Jean Lannes, followed by Pierre Augereau. At the vanguard of the centre was Jean-Baptiste Bernadotte, and behind him, Louis-Nicolas Davout. On the right flank awaited Jean Soul, Michel Ney, and the Bavarian division under Gerhard von der Roy. In reserve was Joachim Marat's heavy cavalry, and the Imperial Guard under Jean-Baptiste Bessières and François Lefebvre. In total, the advance was to be made by around 180,000 French and German soldiers. Despite this highly concentrated preponderance of force, Napoleon expected the going to be tough. Not only would the army be taking the direct route through the hilly Turingewald, but they'd no doubt run into the teeth of Prussian defences. To steal his army for the Turingia campaign, Napoleon addressed his troops on October 6th. Soldiers, before this war began, orders were already issued for your return to France. Triumphal festivities awaited you. But just as we were lulled by a sense of false security, new plots were brewing under the guise of friendship and alliance. Cries of war have been raised in Berlin, and in the last two months, we are each day more loudly challenged. The same war faction, the same vertigo, that carried the Prussians to the fields of Champagne 14 years ago, still dominates their government. They want us to evacuate Germany at the sight of their arms. Fools. Let them learn that it would be a thousand times more easy to destroy Berlin than to besmirch the honour of France and its allies. At the Battle of Vimy, their schemes were dashed to pieces. In Champagne, they found only death, defeat and shame. But the lessons of experience fade, and with some men, hatred and jealousy never die. Soldiers, not one of you would wish to regain France by any other path than that of honour. We must return home only under triumphal arches. Forward then. Let the Prussian army meet with the same fate as at Vimy. Through such direct linkages to the Battle of Vimy, which had saved the French Republic in September 1792, Napoleon was casting the coming campaign as one of national defence. The logic was quite flawed. In 1792, France had been invaded by the Prussians, not the other way round. But it was still important to convince the soldiers and the French public that the invasion of Thuringia was defensive, or at the very least preemptive. That's why Napoleon pinpointed warmongering in the Prussian court. In a subsequent letter, he noted with some amusement that Queen Louise was with the army, dressed in a dragoon's uniform, and, quote, feeding the fire with dispatches to Berlin. The strongest connection to Vimy was the Prussian commander, the Duke of Brunswick. It was he who had invaded France, and it was he who had issued the counterproductive Brunswick Manifesto, threatening to raise Paris if the Republic did not capitulate. Since then, he'd clearly not mellowed out. Several stern ultimatums were issued by Brunswick to Napoleon's German allies, namely the kings of Bavaria and Württemberg. Despite being couched in appeals to German unity, these last-minute ultimatums only strengthened Bavarian and Württemberger resolve. When the Prussian ultimatum to France was delivered on the 8th, the German allies were primed to accept the French view that this was a declaration of war, meaning that this was now a fight to aid France, not attack Prussia. Big talk from Brunswick was not backed up by Prussian arms. French scouts were amazed to encounter no resistance at the Thuringian border. The tough fight Napoleon envisioned would simply not occur. The Prussians had given him an open goal. Taking advantage of this mistake, La Grande Armée was rushed into the breach at dawn on the 8th. Screened by Marat's cavalry, the columns made lightning progress, easily exiting onto the other side of the Thuringewald by the end of the day. Following in the army's wake, Napoleon set up a temporary HQ at Kronach. He noted in orders to his marshals that this was a critical moment, so they had to stay in constant contact to report on any Prussian movements, no matter how small. Still, so far, things quite literally couldn't have gone better. Quote, 
The Prussians do not anticipate our flanking manoeuvre, Napoleon confided to Soul. It will be their doom if they hesitate and lose even a single day. This was a piercingly accurate assessment of the Prussian predicament. The first the Prussian high command learned of the French invasion was about the same time Napoleon was sending this letter to Soule on the afternoon, early evening of October 8th. Three days before, they'd sent Captain Karl von Muffling out to reconnoitre the Thuringian border. Muffling was therefore present when the French attacked, and he raced back to his superiors with the alarming news. The most immediate effect was that Brunswick's plan was in shambles. A French army advancing, as if towards Leipzig, God forbid even Berlin, could not be ignored. Conflicting options were then proposed and discarded one by one. A defence at Leipzig or Dresden, or a withdrawal to Magdeburg or Halle. It took a good few hours for Brunswick to finally make his determination. Hernlow was ordered to immediately stop his conjunction at Erfurt and about face to defend the southern approaches over the Schale River, from Rudolstadt to Schleitz. At the same time, Brunswick would about face and return from Erfurt back east to the western side of the Schale. A reserve under Prince Eugen of Württemberg, brother of Napoleon's ally, had advanced a 13,000 strong reserve from Halle to Magdeburg. Ever ready for action and goaded on by Marsenbach, Hernlow was overjoyed to be unleashed on the French. Despite strict stipulations from Brunswick on what units could be put on the defence, Hernlow overrode them to rush everything he had south. Bogislav von Tauenzin, commander of the Saxon army and a division of Prussians, raced south towards the towns of Alma and Scheiss. To his west, Prince Louis Ferdinand rushed to occupy Rudolstadt and its important east-west crossing. In their haste, they had blundered unwittingly into the path of an avalanche. First to crash into the enemy, Bernadotte's vanguard routed half of Tauenzin's command at Schleitz on the morning of October 10th. As they fled, light brigades under Antoine Lassalle and Edouard Milleux chased the remnants northwest towards Jena. By the evening of the 10th, the three columns of La Grande Armée reported their excellent progress. The central column had broken through to Schleitz, the rightmost columns were exiting near Hof, and the left flank was just south of Saalfeld, poised to attack come morn. Caught up to the advance at Schleitz, Napoleon was somewhat disappointed with the progress of this left column. He gently chastised Lann for delaying by occupying Coburg instead of advancing. Still, these were minor complaints, and Napoleon otherwise praised Lann. Just to be safe, however, he was ordered to hold his advance tomorrow until Augereau reinforced from the south. Reports indicated that a sizable enemy force was marching on Sjalfeld. When Napoleon dispatched this order, he had no idea that by this stage, Lann had already engaged and defeated this enemy force. So this is a good time to take a pause and look at why this little mix-up occurred. The culprit is the fog of war, and it will complicate everything during the campaign. Communications between Napoleon and his subordinates are delayed by time, by enemy action, by misinterpretation, and the information itself is imprecise, contradictory, and often enough encoded. Confusion, in other words, is the norm. There was therefore a tendency to give pretty strict orders, but every order comes with a list of caveats and exceptions. Only advance if you are reinforced, only defend if you are weak, that sort of thing. Napoleon makes up for this by trying to be everywhere at once, and relying upon an excellent staff. But it is still inevitable that his generals will be compelled to rely upon their own recognizance to make a split-second decision. Fortunately, the French have an abundance of talented officers, who Napoleon mostly does trust to make these calls. Not quite so for the Prussians. They were affected very acutely by these problems of command and control, made worse by Hörnler and Brunswick's headbutting. Actually face to face with the French, Hernler felt emboldened to call his own shots. So, a little unfaithfully, he interpreted Brunswick's orders to defend the Schale as implicit permission to cross the Schale and fight the French. It was not. Brunswick wanted a far more defensive posture to be adopted where the French were prevented from crossing, not intercepted. Not that Hernler cared. He now intended to make a stand at Alma. So, to cover his south, Prince Louis Ferdinand was ordered to push onto Schalfeld. The defeat of Tauenzin ruined these plans. Routed Saxon and Prussian regiments streamed west, as Hernlow was crossing the Schale at Jena on the way to Alma. Then when Brunswick learned of the defeat, and Hernlow's flagrant disregard for his orders, he ordered a full stop to any advance. But again, the fog of war clouds everything. Still following Hernlow's original orders, Prince Louis had already crossed the Schale. Fanning his battalions out, 
Prince Louis intended to blast the French to pieces as they exited the hills and forests south of the river. With 8,300 Prussian and Saxon troops covered by 44 guns, chances were good he'd be able to cause some serious damage. Advancing rapidly, Gabriel Suchet's 14,000 strong division was the first to encounter the enemy. Cannonballs slicing through the air, Lunn ordered an immediate attack for 11 a.m. The light regiments went ahead first, supported by Hussars, to skirmish with the Prussians. Covered by this attack, Suchet then reformed the bulk of his division to the west around Bolitz, hoping now to envelop Louis' flank. Spying this, the prince then dispatched some of his own battalions to thwart the flanking manoeuvre. Bitter fighting carried on for the next few hours, the cannon fire so loud it could be heard by Napoleon from the road to Alma. Gradually though, the Prussians and Saxons were pushed back inch by inch, losing Bolitz and then Kresten by 1pm. Seeing the pendulum swing in favour of the French, Prince Louis deployed his cavalry reserve. At the head of five squadrons of sabre-swinging Hussaren, Prince Louis charged the French at Kresten. But a trenchant defence withstood this charge, leaving the Prussians vulnerable as Lan unleashed his own reserve. A composite force of French Uzao and Chasseur à Cheval peered around to the rear and slammed home. Utterly broken, the Prussians fled. Entire units surrendered, or else managed to escape north. Pockets of resistance held out as long as possible, and at the centre of one of these pockets was Prince Louis. A quartermaster of the 10th Hussars, Ordinatio Guidney, engaged Prince Louis on horseback, mortally wounding him with a sabre slash. Prince Louis was just one of around a thousand killed at the Battle of Schaalfeld, 900 Prussians and Saxons, and about 100 French soldiers. Another 1,800 Prussians and Saxons were taken prisoner, along with all of their cannons and supplies. Like Tauenzin's defeated division at Schleitz on the 9th, the shattered husk of the Prussian division fled west back over the Schale. When the full report of the Battle of Schalfeld reached Napoleon, he was chuffed. With two decisive engagements under their belts, the French had handily broken through the first line of Prussian defence. Given the haphazard and ill-prepared nature of this defence, Napoleon read between the lines and concluded that the Prussians must be in a state of disarray. And how right he was, from his headquarters at Erfurt, Adawa Brunswick also received the after-action reports from Schleitz and Saalfeld. Though these defeats could be blamed on Hörnler, Brunswick quite diplomatically did not chase in his co-commander, but rather recalled him back west across the Schale. Hörnler was already one step ahead of him, already withdrawn to Jena just ahead of the French tide. This would cover Brunswick's own redeployment from Erfurt to Weimar. The initiative was now entirely Napoleon's, a fact he was well aware of. What he didn't know was the exact position of Brunswick's army or the Prussian reserve. Given this need for intelligence and the defeat of Louis and Tauenzin, Napoleon gave orders for all his corps to push as hard as they could, essentially making a strategic level of reconnaissance in force. So forging on, Sul reported from the right flank that Plauen was abandoned by the Prussians. Based on this report and intelligence gleaned from intercepted Prussian communications, Napoleon now believed that a sizable Prussian force, probably under Hörnler, was readying to make a stand at Gera to protect the roads leading north to Leipzig. Of course, it was impossible for Hörnler to be in both Jena and Gera at the same time, but I must stress, in the fog of war, it was extremely difficult to discern Prussian movements. In many ways, the disarray of the Prussian forces actually tricked Napoleon here. He was trying to make sense of some very strange Prussian movements. The logical move would be for them to try their hardest to block his advance north, so the defence at Gera looked plausible. Counter reports that in fact Hörnler was concentrating west of the Schale, completely out of position, were chalked up to misidentification, not, as was indeed the case, Brunswick's total bungling of the defence. It was only on the afternoon of October 11th that Napoleon did come to understand his error. Marat cleared Gera of its paltry defences, and then swept most of the river Elster, confirming that in fact there was quite literally nothing between Napoleon and Leipzig. Here now was the critical moment in the campaign. If Napoleon wanted, he could stick to the plan and keep going north to conquer Berlin. But with the Prussians demoralised and bottled up to the west, if ever there was a chance to inflict a decisive defeat, it was now. This was a watershed decision. Would the campaign be one of conquest or one of annihilation? In the end, the choice was a simple one. Prussia could perhaps fight without a capital, but they could not fight without an army. So on October 12th, 
the orders of the day called for a complete refocus of La Grande Armée's axis of advance. Instead of continuing north, they were to pivot left to face west. Alma was now redesignated as the centre of operations. Closest to Alma, Lan and Augereau's corps were no longer the left wing of the army. That job was to be taken up by Ney. Their job now was to form the southern prong of a pincer and strike west over the Shala at Hiena and Kala. Their attack was to be supported by the Vu and Bernadotte of the northern prong, who aimed to outflank Jena to the north. De Vu was to advance on Naumburg and then plunge down on Jena. Bernadotte was to follow the Elster as far as Zeitz and blockade the Prussian reserve near Halle. Inner reserve was Sul's corps and much of Marat's cavalry, now regrouping after their foray east. Though this new plan of attack was entirely improvised, Napoleon was supremely confident. The army had acquitted itself marvellously in the mad dash to take up their new positions, and morale was high. The same could not be said of the Prussians. On the day of the 12th, Hernler had continued his withdrawal out of Jena, and Brunswick lingered on an airfoot. When reports confirmed that de Vaux was at Naumburg, panic gripped the Prussian generals. Their road of retreat northwards to Madgeborg was now threatened, soon to be cut off. The king convened an emergency council of war for the wee small hours of October 13th. Shying away from a decisive battle, Brunswick and others called for a breakout attempt northeast towards Leipzig. At all costs, a pitch battle was to be avoided to keep the army intact. So to cover Brunswick's breakout, Hernlo was ordered to concentrate at Kapellendorf, a town about 12 miles west of Jena. In support was a division of Blücher's army under the command of General Ernst Ruckel. So as they broke, Brunswick's army was finally roused from its stagnancy and marched along the eastern bank of the river Ilm towards their destination of Auerstedt. Awaking at midnight on the 13th, around the same time the Prussians were convening their council of war, Napoleon II reassessed his situation. There was no reason to suspect the day would be anything other than calm. He didn't expect a big battle until around the 16th. But as the morning progressed, reports began to stream into his headquarters at Gera, suggesting that the long-awaited Prussian advance was underway. Scouting at the head of his cavalry, Marat reported that the King and Queen of Prussia had been in Erfurt as recently as the 11th, and that a massive enemy army was somewhere near Weimar. There was only one logical explanation. This had to be Brunswick. Subsequent reports from Davu about heavy activity around Naumburg perhaps suggested that Brunswick intended to attack. But no. De Vu was adamant that the Prussians were panic-stricken, fleeing. Where to? Well, the only logical answer was north, north towards Magdeburg and therefore safety. Augereau confirmed this hypothesis. Enterprising French scouts crossed the Sjala at Kala to find the town abandoned. Hernler was no longer defending the crossings. He was covering Brunswick's retreat. From these scattered reports and unsure sightings, Napoleon intuited almost precisely Brunswick's new plan. Quote, At last the veil is torn, he wrote to Marat. The enemy had begun their retreat to Madgeborg. Clearly, the 13th wouldn't be so quiet as initially thought. Another cascade of orders flowed out of Napoleon's headquarters as he hurriedly raced from Gera to Jena. The worry now was that Brunswick might make a fighting retreat by attacking Lan, so it was important to have other corps ready to support. Morat was ordered to rejoin with Bernadotte and get to Dornberg on the other side of the Schala as soon as possible. Meanwhile, Sul and the heavy cavalry reserve broke camp and made for Roda. With all the pieces now in play, it was vital that Napoleon be kept up to date about what was happening in front of each corps. Premium was placed on staying in near constant communication with the headquarters. Each of the corps commanders did their best here, but trying to send and receive messages from a mobile headquarters whilst also managing their own front lines and communicating with other corps, was a tall order even for the superb French generals. Despite these difficulties, the day went largely to plan, and the corps were quickly at their objectives. But all was not well. At around 3pm, halfway from Guerra to Jena, Napoleon heard the unmistakable sounds of musketry emanating from the west. Not long after, a courier came from Lan to confirm that he was under attack. Here's how it happened. That same morning, Lan's corps had crossed the Schala into Jena to find the town only lightly defended. After thrashing Townsend again and occupying the town, Lan was making ready to march west onwards to Weimar when his scouts reported a bunch of Prussians up to their north. 
Skirmishing erupted all along the line as Hernlow's army heaved into sight. His army of 35,000 had been joined by Rukel, bringing overall Prussian numbers up to 50,000. Their attack caught Lan completely by surprise, as he had not expected to be attacked that day, and certainly not by a superior enemy. The courier sent to Napoleon bore a request for clarification, as under the circumstances, Lan rightly assumed that the march on Weimar was no longer necessary. It was the right decision on Lan's part, and he was ordered to keep doing what he was doing, to stick and hold. The worry now was that Hernler might try to take Yenna that night, so orders were quickly sent for Davu to about face and follow the Schale south from Naumburg down to Jena, so as to encircle Hernler. Bernadotte was to continue to Dornberg and then turn in on the Prussian rear. By the time Napoleon arrived in Jena at 4pm, the worst of the day's fighting was already over. Hernlow's attack never developed from a probe into an all-out assault. That assault was no doubt coming the next day, on the morning of the 14th. Given the scale and audacity of this Prussian move, and the number of enemy campfires as night fell, Lahn felt that north of Jena could only be Brunswick and the main force. Napoleon surveyed the same scene and agreed. Both were mistaken, the consequences to be borne by Davu up north, but either way reinforcements were desperately needed at Jena. Fortunately, the Imperial Guard was at hand. Under cover of dark, they crossed the Sjala to join Lan regulars on the defence. The town of Jena itself was in a poor defensive position, as it was overlooked by the imposing Land Grafenberg Heights to its north and west. During the day, though, Lan had been enterprising enough to take the heights. The linchpin of his defensive line was the highest point on the heights at Windnerlen, which provided a commanding view of the entire area. It was, however, quite literally just a rocky hill. Only one narrow track led to the top. By lantern light, Napoleon oversaw the widening of this track, ordering that each battalion of the guard put in one hour's work. Engineers directed much of this work and used specialised tools to raise or flatten the terrain. Most amazingly of all, this work was completed in just a few hours. By midnight, 40 cannons had been heaved into position atop the Land Grafenburg, later to be joined by 30 more. Meanwhile, the rest of the Imperial Guard and V Corps fanned out across the heights, 46,000 troops in all. Right in the middle of this array, the Emperor pitched camp, surrounded by the Guard Grenadiers. Swapping his lantern for candles, he dictated the order of the day for tomorrow's battle. As morning broke, the first trace of sunlight failed to penetrate a thick fog that had enveloped Jena during the night. It was in this miasma that the Prussian lines drew up. To begin, Hernler advanced out of Apola, a town about three miles to the northwest. On open, fairly flat ground, the Prussians gradually dispersed to cover a wide arc-like front, stretching from Eisenstadt in the west to Dornberg in the north. Much of this advance was obscured by the fog, hampering French reconnaissance. Still, with an enemy lurking somewhere out in the murk, Napoleon ordered the army to make ready. On the confines of the Land Grafenburg, the French lines were forced to be compact. Soldiers stood so close together, breath traced down the napes of each other's necks. But with the heights and the emperor at their backs, the troops were both calm and confident. Dressing the ranks, Napoleon rode from regiment to regiment to give a quick account of what lay ahead. The plan he had outlined the night before was one of phases. Without waiting to be bottled up on the heights, heavy overhead fire from the artillery would cover the advance, as outlying villages were to be seized one by one. Any enemy counterattacks would also have to be repulsed, the hope being that through these efforts, enough time would be bought for Ney, Sul and Marat to arrive and turn the tide. First shots tore through the fog at 6am as Arkin cannon fire opened the battle. The divisions of 5th Corps under Théodore Gazin and Gabriel Suchet broke out of the land Grafenberg and into the valley below. Blanketed by fog and artillery fire, they engaged and drove back Tauenzied's advance guard. Within the hour, Suchet had taken Lutzeroda, and Gazan was on the threshold of Kospeda. Despite suffering heavy losses, Tauenzin rallied several battalions for a counterattack. They briefly succeeded in driving the French out of the villages, but afterwards lost steam quickly under constant bombardment from the guards' all-seeing artillery. A rapid French counterattack retook the villages. Gazan was soon joined by a division of Ney's corps and the guard cavalry, attacking from the south via Eiserstedt. This forced Tauenzin to make a fighting retreat back to Wirtzenheiligen. Heavily forested terrain made the going pretty difficult for the French, and minimised the advantage of their artillery. 
Prussian skirmishers peppered French columns as they advanced, inflicting many losses. For a few more hours, Talenzine held his ground by making effective use of the terrain and his reserves. He'd mostly contained the frontal attack from Lan and Ney, but his northern flank was much less secure. And the old Holzendorf single division was positioned to cover this angle. At around 9am, Louis Vincent Saint Hilaire arrived on scene as the advance guard of Saul's corps. Without breaking step, his regiment succeeded in breaking through Holzendorf at Rödingen. The Junker general fell back across a tributary of the Sjala to defend at Nerkowitz. There he did succeed in blunting Sonilao's advance, but only after a brutal close quarters fight. It took a daring move by Sonny Lao to prevent a stalemate. As Holzendorf began to make attacks back across the stream, Sonny Lao used the cover of terrain and fog to mask a wide flanking maneuver of his grenadiers and line regiments, leaving mostly skirmishers to cover the move. He fell upon Holzendorf at his most vulnerable, pinning him from the rear as Saul's arriving cavalry and the left behind skirmishers moved in for the kill. Nurkowitz was rendered a bloodbath, otherwise steely Prussian nerves frayed during a shambolic retreat. All that now prevented Saul from spilling out onto the plains and annihilating Holzendorf's entire division was Hernlow's own lines arrayed to the west. The collapse of Holzendorf on the Prussian left precipitated Tauenzin's own withdrawal from the centre. Now convinced his position was untenable, he used a lull in the fighting to pull back northwest towards the relative safety of Hernlow's line. The tide had now shifted to favour the French, putting the Prussians on the defensive. So as Tauenzin's scattered battalions were reforming, Hernler issued a hurried order to General Ruckel, requesting immediate aid. Ruckel would arrive from the west along the Jena-Weimar Road, so a Saxon division of three brigades was sent to cover the reinforcements. They held back Lahn and Augereau just long enough for the advance guard of Ruckel's division to make it onto the field. By 11am, the Prussians had a motley, if stable, line, preventing a French breakthrough westward from Eiserstedt. On the French right too, the lines had stabilised, and despite a fierce back and forth at Wirtz and Heiligen, neither side could gain a decisive advantage. Exhaustion too played its part in the pause. The Prussians and Saxons were critically low on ammunition the entire time, and most had marched into battle without having eaten for at least a few days. The French were in better shape, but the effects of weeks of hard marching and campaigning did take its toll. So from around 11am to 12pm, most of the action was performed by skirmishers and cavalry. Ruckel's units were still arriving, as was Ney's corps for the French. Both sides were now aiming to build up their reserve in preparation for a final assault. From a vista atop the heights, Napoleon had a prime view of the unfolding battle. So far, things had gone to plan. The next phase would require a more decisive breakthrough, an ideal job for the reserve amassing at Jena. By around 12pm, 30,000 French troops from Ney and Saul's corps were both arrayed. Napoleon intended to unleash this battle-winning force at an opportune moment, but Ney jumped the gun. Having so far been uncommitted to any major action, both Ney and his officers were rearing to go. As the hours ticked by, his agitation grew until he could stand it no longer. Defying orders, Ney took his own infantry regiments and a few squadrons of the Guard cavalry and advanced into the gap between Lan and Augereau's lines. Not expecting such a brazen attack, the Prussians reeled. Panic seized the Saxon troops who broke and fled, soon followed by dozens of other Prussian regiments. Before long, Wiertzen Heiligen was under Ney's control, along with dozens of captured guns. But the surprise success of his advance was soon to prove a double-edged sword. Since the attack was unplanned, Neither Lan nor Augereau knew to take advantage of the confusion Ney would cause. As a result, they were unable to assist Ney, who was by now badly exposed. Rallied Prussian cavalry descended upon his flanks, as staunch Prussian fusiliers counterattacked from the front. Napoleon watched this shocking reversal and sent reinforcements from Jena. Ney held out just long enough to be relieved, narrowly escaping a calamity of his own making. Ney's unplanned attack accelerated Napoleon's timetable. Instead of waiting for the reserve to be unleashed, Lan and Augereau were ordered to advance at about 12pm to take the pressure off of Ney. Therefore, they marched into the teeth of the Prussian defence. Lan briefly succeeded in taking Fiat and Heiligen, but was later repulsed with heavy losses. Further south, Eiserstedt was recaptured by the Prussians. Augereau too made little headway 
running up against the well-placed guns of Hernle. Here was the Prussian army of Hernfriedberg and Rosbach, highly disciplined and steadfast. But there's a fine line between discipline and rigidity. Hernle was holding well against Augereau and Lann, making for an ideal moment to counterattack. Yet the cautious prince refused to give an order to advance, until Rukel was on scene in sufficient number. Delays and disorder slowed Rukel, so Marsenbach was sent down the Weimar Road to see what was up. This pause in operations permitted Lahn to bring up much of his artillery, and for a full two hours, the length of the Prussian line sustained a brutally effective fusillade of fire from cannons and skirmishes. Given neither orders to advance nor withdraw, the Prussians simply took this withering fire. Well deserving of their renown for discipline, the Prussians did maintain their composure, but at the cost of thousands killed and wounded during this ill-timed pause. At 12.30pm, Napoleon ordered the 30,000 French troops at Jena, now bolstered by 12,000 of Marat's horsemen, to move up into attack positions. This was to be matched with a general advance all along the already engaged French line. A concerted effort from Ney and Augereau sanded away at Hohenlohe's line, forcing him to keep giving ground. Lan too made another attack on Wiertz and Heinigen. Against the tide, the Prussians there held like a rock, but they were not so fortunate at Eiserstedt, which they lost at 1pm. These moves covered the advance of the reserve, bringing total French numbers up to nearly 100,000 troops actively engaged. The walls were now closing in on Hernler. The centre had been just barely holding against Lannes, Ney and Augereau, so what hope was there now that they were joined by Soule and Marat? Meanwhile up north, Sonny Lau's division marched out of Naukowitz to threaten the road to Apolda. And then there was Rukel. Where was Rukel? His failure to arrive in time had forced Hernlode to commit his own scanned reserves, feeding them into the fight. By 1pm, there was nothing more to give. Every Prussian unit was committed. With overawing mass and firepower, the French rumbled forward. Small Prussian units made a valiant last stand, but were quickly isolated and destroyed. Large gaps began to appear in the Prussian line, soon to be exploited by the French horse artillery, now pushing up to grapeshot range. Still holding out hope that Rukel might be able to stabilise the situation, Hernler ordered a staggered withdrawal back to a line from Kleinrömstedt, Gröschrömstedt, to Kirchau. It's a testament to Prussian training that even now, after a day of hard fighting and an imminent defeat, order did not break down on the withdrawal. But order could only last so long as the French attacked relentlessly. Fire from the cannons, charges from Morale's cavalry, assaults from the infantry and grenadiers, all combined to shatter Prussian morale. The first regiments to flee were the Saxons, as usual, soon followed by Prussian cavalry. The Prussian line was now sundered at the centre, split between north and south. The northern line was under Hernlow's direct control. Many of his regiments had simply broken and fled but a rump remained in good enough order to escape north to Apolda alongside Tauenzin. The retreat in the south was not quite so organised. Thousands of Prussian and Saxon troops were captured or killed as they fled west. Those who were not caught by the French soon found themselves running into the advance guard of Rukel's division. Instead of arriving to bail out his fellow general, Rukel had arrived just in time to take part in his defeat. As Prussian troops were fleeing west on the weimar Jena road, or chancing a swim across the Sulbach to safety, amazingly, Rukel decided to stick with his orders. It was obviously too late to imagine doing anything of the sort. The battle was already lost, but orders were orders. Forming that line from Grosch-Römstedt to Kirchau by 3pm, Rukel narrowly outpaced Lahn's own advance. But rather than form the phalanx on which the French would flounder, this belated Prussian defence was little more than a speed bump. Every gun to hand was aimed on the line, killing hundreds and demoralising the rest. A broad attack was then launched by the French heavy cavalry. In the crunch of the charge, Rukel's line simply disintegrated. A third of his force was killed or captured in about an hour, the rest to join the survivors of Hernlow's army in the long route west. Sporadic fighting would continue for the rest of the day and into the night. Marat pursued the Prussians as far as Weimar, while Soul bounded north to a polder on Townsend's tail. Nightfall was the only saving grace for the Prussians. They left behind 10,000 dead. Another 15,000 had been captured during the battle or during the pursuit. Pretty well all of the Prussian cannons had been captured too, 
along with their supplies and dozens of flags and colours. The lopsidedness of the victory perhaps disguises just how difficult the Battle of Yana had been. 5,000 French soldiers lay dead upon the field, mostly around the hard-won villages defended so doggedly by Townsend. Many more were killed in Ney's own reckless charge when he was nearly enveloped by a renewed Prussian assault. Had it not been for Napoleon's quick thinking, the Battle of Yana might have devolved into a large but indecisive clash. The divisional commanders like Suchet, Gazin and Saint-Hilaire must be commended for their superb attacks against a powerful enemy. So too must the corps commanders, Ney excluded, be noted for their steadfastness and flexibility. But it was Napoleon who had decided the battle by dealing so decisively with the day's many crises. In the morning, as Suchet and Gazin ran aground against the fortress villages, Napoleon's direction of the artillery fire had been brilliant. When it became clear that the enemy were well protected, even from the enfilading fire from atop the heights, Napoleon sent the batteries forward to pour grape shot into the enemy. Later, an unfussed Napoleon abandoned his second phase of operations to skip ahead to the third when it became necessary to rush all units to Ney's aid. Reinforcements were released to bolster the lines at critical moments, and afterwards, to carry out the attacks that eventually broke Hernlow's line. The only grumbling about this tactic arose from the guard, who were never employed. During the afternoon, one young guardsman stepped forward to shout en avant to the emperor as he rode by. A little piqued, Napoleon admonished his eager soldiers, replying, quote, Only a beardless youth would judge what I ought to do. Let him command thirty pitched battles before he gives me advice. Leaving the pursuit in Marat's capable hands, Napoleon returned to his headquarters atop the land of Grafensburg. The path up to the heights was now adorned with thirty or more captured enemy colours, and the guard, who had stood at attention since 4am, triumphantly cried, Vive l'Empereur. But amidst the cries was another sound, an ominous one, the din of cannon fire. It was not inconceivable that some cannons were still plinking away at fleeing Prussians, but to hear full fusillades emanating from the north was concerning indeed. Nobody should be that heavily engaged, especially now that Napoleon had crushed Brunswick's entire force. But this illusion was shattered as Napoleon entered his headquarters to find a Capitaine Taubriand, an officer from Davou, who bore in hand the most alarming news. Far from having engaged and defeated Brunswick, Napoleon had only in fact engaged and defeated the inferior force of Hernler. A stunning victory, yes, but one that left the Prussian army mostly intact. Instead, Tobriand insisted that Davu was, at that very moment, fighting for his life against Brunswick's entire might. At first, Napoleon dismissed the idea out of hand. It was impossible. There were far too many soldiers at Yenna today to have just been a portion of the enemy's strength. But then the pieces began to slot into place, and the terrible, unavoidable realisation dawned. Davu really was out on his own. Napoleon had made a terrible mistake. The weight of that error had fallen entirely upon the shoulders of Marshal Louis-Nicolas Davout, but fortunately for Napoleon, Davout's shoulders were broad, and the certain catastrophe that would have resulted under the command of any lesser talent did not happen on Davout's watch. The unlikely story of how Davout's isolated Third Corps at first fought to a standstill and then crushed a vastly superior enemy force begins with the orders Napoleon sent out on the night of the 13th. Bernadotte was to advance on Dornberg, north of Jena, to sever Brunswick's line of retreat. Davout, trailing just behind, was to race from Naumburg down the Schale to aid Bernadotte. Now had Brunswick indeed been at Jena, there would have been no problem with these orders. But since he was not, there was no inkling that Davout, rather than forming a flanking force, would instead bear the brunt of the enemy's attack. Davout received his orders to race south at about 4am on the 14th just a few hours before the Battle of Jena was to commence. He relayed these orders to Bernadotte, who was nearby, and then departed Naumburg. Napoleon's expectation was that Davout would be at Jena or thereabouts by about midday, but Davout knew the going would be tougher than that. Heavy enemy presence had been detected all to his front, rear, and west throughout the previous night, and it was generally known that a large enemy force was gathering somewhere to the west. That force was Brunswick's, whose line of retreat ran straight through Naumburg, where Davout was stationed. During the night, he'd advanced as far as the heights of Hassenhausen. The division under Wilhelm von Schmettau held the heights, while Brunswick made camp at Auerstedt a little to the west. Under the assumption that Napoleon himself was in Naumburg, Brunswick wanted his men well rested before a clash with the emperor himself. As Davout advanced west out of Naumburg the next morning, 
The same fog that blanketed Jena hung heavy over Auerstedt. Schmettau was in the process of withdrawing his infantry back to Auerstedt when fire erupted from amidst the fog. Entire batteries of Prussian guns and dozens of supply wagons were overrun as French hussars loomed out of the fog on a headlong charge. They were followed quickly by the infantry of Charles Etienne Goudon's division. With fighting erupting to his rear, Schmettau about faced to form a defensive line along the river Lisbach by 8 a.m. Gerhard von Blücher reformed the cavalry to the north at the same time. As the fog dissipated, it soon became clear to Schmettau just how light the French attack really was. Goudon's division of 9,000 was alone on the plains around Hassenhausen, easy prey for a rapid counter-attack. But instead of now pressing his numerical superiority, Schmettau chose to await Leopold von Wautensleben, who Brunswick dispatched to his aid. The delay bristled the whiskers of old Blücher, who could not wait idly by. A pell-mell charge collided with Goudon's division. French squares fought Blücher's cavalry to a complete standstill, so that by 9am, the Prussian cavalry force was spent for zero gain. In the meantime, Davoud continued to urge his divisions onwards. Bugles and drums marked the arrival of Louis Friant and Charles-Antoine Meurant. Friant assumed position on Goudon's right, and Meurant, tracing the cellar, occupied the left flank. They deployed their artillery just in time to catch Schmettau and Wartensleben as they ascended from the low ground around the Lisbach. Those suffering horrific losses from the French guns, at first the Prussian advance progressed well. An isolated regiment of Goudon's division was routed, and the French line badly dented at the middle. Hassenhausen changed hands multiple times as the French buckled under the strain of near overwhelming Prussian numbers. This was the critical moment of the battle. Davout believed, understandably, that unless reinforced, his division was toast. There were simply too many Prussians, many of whom had not even been engaged yet. Only Bernadotte's corps was nearby, but they were streaming south, away from the fight. Frantic letters to his fellow marshal went unanswered, as Bernadotte stuck to his original orders from Napoleon. There would be no reinforcements. Davout was on his own. The tide did begin to tilt imperceptibly at first, around midday. Despite their massive numbers, the Prussians were engaged over a relatively narrow area of high ground, where their superiority of numbers never translated into local superiority of numbers. Furthermore, no attempts were made to outflank the French, either to the north or south. Had Blücher not blundered away his force that morning, he might well have decided the battle then and there with a wide flank from the north. It didn't help that Blücher's bungling was not an isolated incident. Schmettau, Wautensleben and the Prince of Orange failed to properly coordinate any of their attacks, and indeed often ran into each other's reeling and reforming units. The sudden about phase two meant that the roads were clogged with wagons which impeded progress. But the real tipping point came when the Duke of Brunswick himself suffered a mortal injury. In an assault on Hassenhausen, a musket ball struck the Duke's head and destroyed his eyes. Blinded, he was carried away from the battlefield. An already confused Prussian command was now without even nominal direction. Blücher was off doing his own thing. Wautensleben and the Prince of Orange were heavily engaged. Schmettau too, the only logical battlefield replacement for the mortally struck Brunswick, was himself killed at the head of a charge. Similarly, old Merlendorf was captured, somehow. That left King Friedrich Wilhelm, who was watching the battle unfold, by default in overall command. But this Hearns alone was no soldier. Instead, his orders were directly counterproductive. The massive reinforcements held in reserve at Auerstedt, he refused to engage on the presumption that this was Napoleon he was fighting, and the Emperor surely had something up his sleeve. Of course, Napoleon posed no danger to Friedrich Wilhelm. At this moment, the Emperor was unleashing his reserves on Hernlo's main line and about to achieve victory. No, it was entirely Davout, whom the King of Prussia had to fear. With the Prussians exhausted and crippled by indecision, Davout chose a perfect moment to counterattack. Unlike the Prussians, the French lines moved with purpose and grace, a solid mass of blue and red, their bayonets sparkling in the sunlight. Their unchecked advance scoured the field of Prussians, who fled into the narrow defiles around the Lisbach. Trapped between the trees and the water by 12.30pm, King Friedrich Wilhelm watched helplessly as the cream of his army, two splendid divisions, were eviscerated in a perfectly executed crossfire. French momentum was only arrested by the reserve at Auerstedt, 
who though they didn't budge, peppered Goudon and Meran with cannon fire. As it was clear the battle was lost, the Prussian reserve withdrew. De Vu was now free to continue the pursuit, but given the exhaustion and depletion of his divisions, this pursuit was rather lacking, and most of the Prussians escaped. Under the circumstances, it was understandable. 26,000 of Davout's men had stood strong against the Prussian army of 64,000. French losses speak to the disparity of numbers. Nearly 7,000 French soldiers were killed, including about 250 officers, an unusually large percentage. But they'd given as good as they got. 10,000 Prussians were killed, a further 3,000 captured. As ever, the bounty in captured cannons and supplies was great too. Amidst the carnage, feats of valour and bravery were recorded for both sides, and though plenty of blame is to be heaped on the Prussian generals, none can be accused of cowardice. Schmettau was dead, and Brunswick was soon to expire from his terrible wound. For such a long career as Brunswick's, it was quite an ignominious end. He lived just long enough to bring about the end of his beloved army. By contrast, de Vu was at the apex of his career, a career already chock full of highlights and victories yet to come. Once the extent of the victory at Auerstedt became apparent, and the odds which had been overcome, Napoleon was not stingy with a claim. Had he not already been a marshal, de Vu certainly would have been invested with a baton. But since he already was, Napoleon was instead effusive with praise to the victor of Auerstedt and his brave soldiers. From Weimar on the 16th, Napoleon wrote, My cousin, I congratulate you with all of my heart on your splendid conduct. I regret the brave soldiers you have lost but they are dead on the field of honour. Inform your corps and your generals of my satisfaction. They have forever acquired a claim in my esteem and my gratitude. It's undeniable that de Vu had plucked the iron out of the fire for his emperor. Had Third Corps been crushed at Auerstedt, a dark pall would have been cast on the Turingia campaign, even in spite of the triumph at Jena. But between the two battles, Auerstedt certainly stands out as the more incredible given the odds. It is often said of the whole affair that, quote, at Jena, Napoleon had won a battle he could not lose, while at Auerstedt, de Vu won a battle he could not win. Between all the back padding, there was still plenty of recrimination to go around on the French side, and two of our marshals are not going to fare so well in the aftermath. Ney was of course admonished for his untimely charge at Jena, which had thrown the whole outcome into jeopardy. On the day, he was summoned to Napoleon to receive a polite but stern verbal reprimand. Only in the days and weeks after would Ney begin to feel the Emperor's displeasure. It was an uncharacteristic blemish on Ney's otherwise stellar record. The issue though was not with his initiative, but rather his breaking of orders. A decision sooner expected of impetuous Marat rather than the staunch Ney. Regardless, Napoleon's true ire was reserved for Bernadotte. Though marching all day, he had failed to arrive on either battlefield. But more damningly, had left de Vu out to dry. Bernadotte pled his innocence, citing not one, but two instances where he'd been ordered to march south. The first from Berthier on the night of the 13th, and the next from de Vu on the morning of the 14th. Conveniently ignored was the understanding that de Vu and Bernadotte were to move in mutual support, so as to avoid exactly the situation that transpired at Auerstedt. Certainly there is validity to the idea that the fog of war did shroud everything in a layer of doubt, but despite this, Bernadotte ultimately did choose to leave de Vu behind a slight for which there was to be no forgiveness. Quote, I ought to have Bernadotte shot, Napoleon confided, and indeed had he not been a marshal, or had Auerstedt seen de Vu beaten, Bernadotte probably would have been. Perhaps then that's why Bernadotte was so vigorous in his pursuit of Hernlow's fleeing divisions. As the only unengaged and therefore relatively rested corps, Bernadotte hurled his divisions west. Fleeing Prussian units were given no respite as Bernadotte hurried them without rest. This worthwhile but futile gesture failed to put the marshal back in Napoleon's good graces. Despite these sour notes, overall, the Turingia campaign was a triumph. A total victory in every sense. Just over a week earlier, on October 6th, Napoleon had been stealing his men for a tough campaign. One fought into difficult terrain against Europe's reigning champion of the battlefield. Now, amidst the wreckage of not one, but two Prussian armies, the French could claim to be the premier military force in Europe. They were, quite simply, invincible. There's a reason David Chandler names his chapter on the campaign, Rosbach Avenged. Certainly Napoleon drew this same conclusion, later writing that, quote, 
the Battle of Jena has effaced the affront of Rosbach. But for now, the campaign remained unclosed. Until the Prussians surrendered, this clash of eagles, the Black Eagle of Prussia, the Golden Eagle of France, would continue. The campaign may have been decided upon the field at Jena and Auerstedt, but it would not be won until Berlin surrendered and the tricolor fluttered above the Brandenburg Gate. 